Okay, well, uh, hi, my name's Darren Nash. Dinosaurs, dinosaurs are one of the most um, uh, popular groups of animals. The, well, they're one of the most popular groups of animals living or extinct. I mean, more people have heard about various obscure, long extinct dinosaurs than have heard about various obscure living animals, which is pretty weird when you think about it. The popularity of dinosaurs is such that there's what appears to be a constant eternal demand for new books on dinosaurs, particularly for kids. And since breaking into the world of publishing in 2001, I have just about managed to scratch a living as a um, freelance uh, author and consultant <laughs> dealing with these kinds of books. Here's, a, here's just some of the books that I've uh, um, written or been involved in. Now, I've got no idea how weird this will sound, but it's a, an eternal source of frustration to me that... Um, even at this point in my career, I haven't actually finished or written any of the books I would like to because I'm busy taking on more jobs in order to bring in income. There's no money in publishing whatsoever, for those of you who don't know. Having said that, there are a few books that I am especially proud of. They include The 2001 Dinosaurs of the Isle of Wight, which you can now buy for about £160. That money doesn't get to me, by the way. Uh, 2009's The Great Dinosaur Discoveries, the 2014 All Yesterdays, and the 2016 Dinosaurs, How They Lived and Evolved, published by the Natural History Museum, co-authored with the museum's Paul Barrett. This book has just gone to second edition. It's on sale here today. Please do uh, buy one. And most of what I say in this talk is relevant to material that's included within Dinosaurs, How They Lived and Evolved. Now, for much of the 20th century, dinosaurs were characterised as ungainly, useless, stupid animals, waste of space, poorly adapted for their lifestyles, evolutionary dead ends, good for nothing more than going extinct. Of course, this is not at all true. During a scientific event called the Dinosaur Renaissance, or Renaissance if you're American, Yale's John Ostrom and his vociferous PhD student Robert Backer argued that dinosaurs in fact were agile, active, dynamic animals with huge muscles, complex teeth, sophisticated chewing mechanisms, really interesting social lives, good fun at parties. Um, they were far from being evolutionary failures. Dinosaurs were actually one of evolution's great success stories. They dominated life on land for something like 160 million years. Ostrom and Backer both argued that dinosaurs are not extinct. Around about 170 million years ago, during the Middle Jurassic, a new group of small feathered predatory dinosaurs evolved. And this group, of, this group survived that mass extinction event that happened 66 million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous. And this group survived to the present day. There's about 10,000 of them around now, 10,000 species that is. This group is called Aviolae, the birds. Birds are dinosaurs. They're not just relatives of dinosaurs or descendants of dinosaurs. They literally are one of the many dinosaur lineages. And abundant fossils from the Jurassic and Cretaceous confirm that many features that we once thought unique to birds were actually widespread in non-bird dinosaurs, most famously feathers. We've now got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feathered non-bird Jurassic and Cretaceous dinosaurs. Here are just a few examples. And what these fossils show is that in life, non-bird predatory dinosaurs, so velociraptor type dinosaurs, they did not look like the bipedal scaly lizard monsters of the Jurassic Park and Jurassic World films, no, these animals were extremely bird-like. They would have looked like big, goofy, archaic birds, as is represented in these various artistic reconstructions. Evo Devo genome sequencing, advances in embryology and 3D digital imaging all mean that within the last few years, experts have been able to show how many aspects of bird anatomy represent modified versions of ancestral, more air quotes, dinosaur-like conditions, which can be reactivated if we change the timing and pattern of embryological development. And this has actually led some paleontologists to propose that we should use our knowledge of genetics and embryology to turn modern chickens into um, toothy-jawed, claw-fingered, long-tailed little velociraptor-type neo-dinosaurs. This is called the Dino Chicken Project, or Chicken Saurus Project. It's led by Dr. Jack Horner, the world's best paleontologist, looking very dark there. Um, is the Chicken Saurus Project, or Dino Chicken Project, a good idea? 
I don't know. My personal feeling is that it won't result in the creation of some kind of beautiful, inspirational wonder of evolution. Instead, we'll end up with some ugly bastard mutant little chicken monster that will be both an affront to chickenry and reminiscent of scenes from Alien 3. What makes this story interesting is this animal from the 16th century, Aldrovandi's monstrous rooster, but I'm not going to talk about it. Go and check Tetrapod Zoology if you want to hear the story on this animal. It's a 16th century dino chicken. Um, that weird naked tail, I mean, what the hell's going on there? You should expect as a dino chicken, as a modified chicken, it should have a luxuriantly feathered, beautiful tail. Chickens are, of course, fantastically flamboyant, beautiful, spectacular animals. Something that's true of a great many birds, as you can see from the selection here. And it's being increasingly recognised this was true of non-bird dinosaurs as well. Fossils show that loads of these animals were really flamboyant and weird. They didn't just have feathers, they had bristles and quills and spikes and areas of stored fat and big floppy skin sections and stuff that would have made their soft tissue outlines look really quite different from the outlines that we would predict based just on their bones alone. It, it may be that quite a few extinct dinosaurs look really different from conventional interpretations. And this is an idea that myself, John Conway, just scanning the audience to see if he's here and he's not, and Memo Kozman explored in this 2014 book, um, All Yesterdays, which I mentioned earlier. Let's give you some specific examples of uh, what I'm talking about here. So here's the skull of Pachycephalosaurus. It's a, a dome-skulled dinosaur. And here's a conventional depiction of what this animal might have looked like in life. But some experts on these dinosaurs have proposed that that bony skull dome was merely the core of a far larger soft tissue structure made of keratin, so horn and skin and so on. Slap on enough keratin and you end up with this, uh, a depiction that's very different from the conventional one. I am not saying that this is accurate. I'm saying that this is a rendition that's been endorsed by some experts on this group. Now let's think about sauropods, the gigantic long-necked herbivorous dinosaurs. There is actually a proposal out there, published in 2004, that the gigantic necks of these dinosaurs evolved under sexual selection pressure. The idea is that the neck was used as a sexual display structure and it hence you know, became longer and bigger over time. That's the paper which proposed it. I think this is almost definitely wrong. In fact, myself and a bunch of colleagues published a paper in 2011 where we argued very strongly against this idea. But... Um, we should still take seriously the possibility that these animals did use their gigantic necks as display structures. And if we do take that idea seriously, well, there's the possibility they could have looked very weird indeed. Maybe some of them had giant flappy neck curtain things. Maybe some of them had giant dangly wattily neck dewlap things. Maybe some of them had giant inflatable spiny neck sack things. Maybe some of them had paired ventral rows of big thorn-like spike things. Having mentioned sexual display, uh, at the risk of repeating some of the uh, material in previous talks, but don't worry, there'll be no overlap, uh, let's talk about the reproductive biology of dinosaurs. Now, there's an off-stated claim, and you can read various rewordings of it in the text here. There's an off-stated claim that paleontologists just don't spend their time thinking about dinosaur sex enough. Why aren't paleontologists talking about dinosaur mating habits? What are paleontologists doing with their time? Um, and they're... Um, you know, it's, 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 someone really needs to go in there, if you'll pardon the expression, and, you know, really you know, bring some rigour and logic to the subject. Well, in reality, I assure you that a great many paleontologists have thought about, written about, and even reenacted the mating poses and abilities of extinct dinosaurs. And there is even some actual quantifiable, testable science on this issue. Now... Before I continue in this vein, you might be curious about the sexual anatomy of non-bird dinosaurs. What do we know? Well, we've got very little direct evidence. So what we do is we use this technique called phylogenetic bracketing. You look at the living animals that surround the extinct ones you're interested in in the family tree. So we've got living crocodilians, we've got living birds. They bracket extinct dinosaurs. And based on this phylogenetic bracketing technique, we, we can you know, come up with a whole bunch of uh, fairly sensible inferences. So sticking just to the basics, 
there would have been a single external sexual chamber, the cloaca, which of course would have been shared with the gut and uh, the uh, bladder. Uh, males would have had an irreversible penis that was normally stowed away at the front part of the cloaca, but could be like uh, shrunk, uh, uh, erected when, uh, when, when needed. Um, would have been fairly large and curved with a cup-like head. The testes would have been fairly large, deeply internal, tucked up close to the kidneys. In females, there would have been a clitoris uh, homologous to the penis in an exactly the same place. In the majority of non-bird dinosaurs, uh, there's actually a crocodilian, an alligator clitoris over there, but it's hard to see. Um, uh, there would, in the majority of uh, non-bird dinosaurs, have been paired oviducts leading into the cloaca. There wouldn't really have been a vagina per se, but at least some of the non-bird dinosaurs would have been bird-like in only having a single oviduct. You know, most birds only have one oviduct leading into the cloaca. <clears throat> Of course, ordinarily, most of this stuff would not have been visible from the outside. There just would have been like a, a slit-like genital aperture, which you could hopefully see in the middle there. I skipped ahead too quickly. Um, now, whenever people talk about um, dinosaur sex, most of them start by discussing the late paleontologist Beverly Halstead up there on the, on the right of that uh, illustration, because uh, Halstead became famous or infamous for reenacting dinosaur uh, sexual poses on stage during his talk. I'm not going to do this today, don't worry. He was normally accompanied, although not always, by a consenting female partner. Not always a, a lady, though. Um, and Halstead um, argued that extinct dinosaurs must surely have practiced the same leg-over technique, or leg-over back technique, as it's technically known, that's seen in modern lizards and crocodilians. Um, and the dinosaur books and articles that he authored or was involved in, they pretty much all of them include at least one illustration of dinosaurs engaged in <clears throat> mating behavior. And following Halstead's lead, a great many other scientists, authors, artists, illustrators, they have also depicted uh, non-bird dinosaurs engaged in sexual, uh, in, in, in actual mating poses. I mean, there's no way you can say there's too little of this stuff. If anything, there's actually too much of it. I don't know if you can see, but you might have noticed that some of the animals here have got really interesting facial expressions. And that's not a fluke. I did actually uh, correspond with the uh, artist, Jose Pena, and he confirmed this is very deliberate. There is, in fact, an entire book called Dinosaur Sex, published in 2015 by Michael Brookfield. But I have to say it's somewhat unusual, or maybe somewhat more unusual than you might expect, because it includes long sections on masturbation, <laughs> fetishism, and homosexuality. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of those things. There's, there's, there's fine. There's no shame in it. Don't feel ashamed if you stay awake at night thinking about gay dinosaurs and masturbation in dinosaurs. That's fine. But he includes that stuff, but he doesn't include a whole bunch of stuff on which we do have actual data. I also have to comment on the, the cover. Now, this illustration is produced by Spanish artist Raul Martan. It is the most famous of the dinosaur mating pictures. But again, it's really weird. I mean, to me, it looks like these animals are just standing very close to one another. They might be good friends, but they're not friends with benefits. They, um, they, we're not seeing... I'm not convinced there's any penis in cloaca action going on here. Um, they appear to be distracted by something over to the right, a crash landing pterosaur or an exploding UFO or something. This uh, painting was actually produced to a to accompany a museum mount, <laughs> which is on display at the Jurassic Museum of Asturias in, in Spain. It's a brilliant mount. It's very daring. But again, I'm not convinced we're actually seeing any intimate contact really going on here. The, there's no leg over back action that we really need to see to really you know, buy into it. Two things are always raised, pardon the expression, whenever we talk about dinosaur sex. One of them is that some dinosaurs were really big, I mean, as goes overall size. So shouldn't there be some problem as goes bipedal rearing and mass distribution if we assume, as I think we should, that males placed at least some of their weight on females during mating. <clears throat> well, some people, including those who think they're very clever, have said, well, surely the obvious answer to this weight distribution problem is the animals mated in water. That would have solved all their problems. Buoyancy would have solved all their problems. These people have never tried having sex in the sea. And secondly, <laughs> this, this swimming pool, you can hang on to the edge, but this doesn't take, this doesn't take account of dinosaur pneumaticity. 
Many of these dinosaurs, sauropod dinosaurs in particular, were hugely pneumatic. They had an air sac system. A series of large air-filled sacs were connected by tubes to the lungs, distributed throughout, <coughs> throughout most of the skeleton and also throughout most of the body uh, cavity. Um, now, this um, pneumatic system is mostly to do with respiration, but it, it made the animals lighter than they would otherwise have been, and it would also have made a difference if they were to go into water. These animals were fully terrestrial, but what would the pneumatic system mean for their you know, buoyancy if they were to immerse themselves in water? Well, this was actually tested by Canadian paleontologist Donald Henderson in a 2004 digital modelling study devoted to the flotation dynamics of sauropods. Don's technique has been extensively... Don's technique, I won't use that again. Don's uh, has been extensively ground-truthed on uh, living animals, turtles, alligators, elephants, horses. In fact, in uh, 2010, Don and I published a study in which we aimed to use this technique to answer that fabled question about the swimming abilities of giraffes. Is it true that giraffes can't swim? And we found, so far as we can tell using digital models, we couldn't use a real giraffe, it wouldn't let us. Uh, they probably can swim, but they're really bad at it. Uh, what would this, anyway, what, what does the technique may, mean when you apply it to, to sauropods? Well, Don found they were highly buoyant. They would have floated really high in the water like giant corks. They would have been really uh, unstable and prone to tipping. So, is it true that, you know, would they have preferred sex in water? Well, no, this was almost certainly really difficult for them. And I think instead, I honestly think that we should bear in mind many of them live like thousands of kilometres away from large bodies of water anyway. Some of them live in deserts. Um, we should instead imagine them doing all of their sexual stuff on land, even if this was awkward, dangerous, risky. I mean, it's sex. It's meant to be awkward, dangerous, risky. It really is. The second great issue that's meant to be... Um, that's often mentioned when we consider the mating habits of non-bird dinosaurs is the remarkable body shapes of some of these animals. Consider stegosaurs. <laughs> All species have got rows of plates and spines and things along the dorsal midline. There's no way these animals are practicing that leg over manoeuvre. It, it really leaves you scratching your head as goes how they could actually have engaged in pairing. How did cloacal contact occur? Well, we don't know. Uh, but we have speculated quite a lot. Maybe one day we'll find two preserved uh, that way. It's not impossible. It's very unlikely. There's the suggestion that they engaged in uh, ventro-ventral copulation while standing bipedally. Now, this is quite rare uh, in the animal world, but it's, it's not impossible. There's also the possibility that the female reclined on her side while she was straddled by the male. I went through all 245 positions, not literally, I looked at all 245 positions on the Sex Positions Club website, and this is closest to what's known as reverse creme brulee. There's also... <laughs> there's, there's the possibility that they did some like diagonal scissoring thing or that they backed into each other end to end. Or then there's the possibility that they maybe had particularly large and or flexible organs, either male and or female organs. I consider it appropriate to say at this point, use your imagination, but... Uh, um, well, this, don't blame me, this is... Uh, produced by my colleague and co-author Memo Kozman. It, again, is from that book, All Yesterdays. It depicts a frustrated male stegosaur who is about to have what's known as an interspecies interaction with a very unlucky uh, sauropod. Uh, it's speculative, but, you know. Uh, now, there's tons more I could say. I'll leave it there. Everything I've mentioned in this talk is in some way connected. Don't get the wrong idea, but it's in some way connected to material that's included in Dinosaurs, How They Lived and Evolved, which is on sale today. Please buy one. Um, and if you're interested in the sort of stuff I write about and talk about, please visit me at tetchpodswology.tetzoo.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>